Well, hello and welcome to the Baltic Triangle, regarded as many as the creative hub of Liverpool at the moment. And tonight we're here to talk about mental health in the creative industries. It's a real, real issue. And even before the pandemic dropped, it was a critical issue. 73% of independent musicians had experienced negative emotions such as anxiety, stress, depression in relation to their musical careers. So tonight we're going to be discussing all aspects of that, how people have been affected within the music industry, their mental health, the health of the industry professionals as well, and what we can do to maintain a healthy and creative mind and seek support when needed. Yes, tonight we're talking mental health. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for being here tonight. Let me introduce you to some people here who work within the music industry. First of all, we've got Daniel Zander, who is a, a music producer. He's also head of music operations for Tough.Earth. And we've got Daisy Gill, who's here as well. She is a singer-songwriter. And right on the end, we've got Matty Kane, who is the CEO of The First Person Project, which deals with at, uh, matters relating to mental health. First of all, if I can come to you, Daniel, tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Uh, I'm a record producer based at the Motor Museum in Liverpool, uh, up on, well, just off Lark Lane. Uh, and I'm also head of music operations for the charity Tough, which is the Unity of Faiths Foundation, uh, which is an organisation all about sort of co uh, community cohesion, uh, building bridges between communities, and they do that through projects in sports, arts, and sciences. So, we want to do daily, uh, uh, daily, <laughs> daily, 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 daily. <laughs> yeah. Nice Daisy. to meet you. Ah, yeah, indeed. Now, you are <laughs> a, a singer and songwriter, but we need to know a little bit more than just that, don't we? Yeah, well, I'm from Liverpool, obviously. Very, very scouse. Um, and I write songs, yeah. and that's pretty much how it goes. I'm not playing music in live venues, and I don't get booed very often, so we're on a good track. <laughs> Well, the main, as I say, the main reason that we're here tonight is we're going to talk about mental health within the, in the creative industries and that. And Matty, who I mentioned there, who is the, uh, the CEO of the First Person Project, dealing with, with the problem that we have within mental health. Tell us a little bit about your organisation, if you would, please. OK, so uh, I'm founder of First Person Project. We are a non-profit organisation. We, we come at it from the, the mental health world from a bit of a different perspective, a bit more of a proactive perspective rather than a reactive perspective. Um, we believe in the power of communities and people coming together, um, underpinning progressive social change really, rather than trying to identify the cause of mental illness in the individual. Yeah. Well, let's make a start and remember as well why you're here folks, if you want to be part of what we're doing here, if you feel as though there's a question that perhaps maybe we should talk about, feel free to just put your hand up, I'll come to you, I'll get that question from you, ask it to any of the uh, members of the panel. So, mental health used to be so heavily glamorised and now artists and industry professionals are a lot more open about their own struggles and the author Matt Haig once quoted that we have an obsession with turning troubled artists into tortured geniuses. Let's go with you on this one, if you would please, um, to start off with Daniel. Do you feel as there's a lack of understanding in the music industry? Um, I think for me, uh, yeah, there is a lack of understanding, I think, but that lack of understanding is sort of, um, when you think of mental health and you think of creative people, um, for me, sort of creativity and self-destructive behaviour kind of go hand in hand. So the more creative someone is, whether it's that in, in an artistic way or that's a scientific way, like for someone like uh, Albert Einstein, for example, he was incredibly tortured. Uh, you know, in that way. So I think for me, the more creative you are, the more self-destructive you can become. Um, and I think it's indicative of the nature of a creative person. And that's why in, for example, the music industry, we find that uh, a lot of the people suffer with mental health. It's not because of the industry per se, it's because those people are drawn to a creative industry, which then shows the signs of a pandemic of mental health. Right, see, this is the thing, I suppose if you've got somebody who's uber creative if you like and they set these huge high standards for themselves which in a lot of cases are unachievable they may well be absolutely perfect but in their eyes it's just that little bit short and that's where the problem comes into it isn't it yeah and I, i'm certainly guilty of that you know it's it's you know you self constantly criticize yourself always trying to do better always trying to improve um, and you do sort of put these standards in place where they, sometimes they are unachievable. But I think that's why in creative industries, I mean, like people like Daisy, you know, you think of, um, you know, 
Amy Winehouse, or you know, an artist you've been compared to before. You know, she she had an alcohol problem, a drug problem, and obviously that stemmed from mental health. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, as I say, it it is just indicative of creative people. Um, and I think that's why it's amazing to to be involved in something like this to shine a light on yeah. it, so we can get a bit more of an understanding. And everybody here has got some kind of story that they can relate to, and that we'll go into more detail on that in a short while. But uh, Daisy, as a performer, as a singer, an artist. You're on stage, everybody's looking at you thinking, wow, there's a woman oozing with confidence. The world's at her feet. Is that what it's always like? Or is when you get on that stage, is that a release for you? Talk us through the emotion, if you would. I mean, I think it's it's different when you're doing a bog standard covers gig, for example, because, you know, you're there to entertain. You're there almost in, in the hospitality industry. So it's very different when you're performing in that sense because, for being honest, a lot of people don't really care yeah. <laughs> that yeah. having the dinner. But when I'm doing my own stuff as a songwriter and I'm doing my own gigs, I feel like there's a lot more pressure because you know there's other people there who are musically advanced too. Yeah. And they're probably judging you. But I think overall, going back to what Daniel said before, I think... Most people who are creative and are musicians do generally suffer with mental health. A trend I've noticed within a lot of people I've met in the music industry is a lot of ADHD. It's mm. slightly on the autistic spectrum. A lot of people I know wow. who are very creative are like that. And there's nothing wrong with it, but that is within itself. Even I've got ADHD. Having ADHD comes with its own mental health problems. Yeah. Like... Sometimes we can be associated with having bipolar. Right. So, so. I suppose that from your point of view, you mentioned that if you're doing covers, you're kind of on safer ground because you know that these are well and oh, don't get well me wrong. Trodden songs. There's been times when there's been people really rude to me, and that really yeah. messes up me. But you're in an alcohol environment as yeah, well. Yeah, like sometimes. even yeah. even like just there's been gigs where I've been doing like local gigs, and it's you know on the songwriter scene, and you just get people just being rude for no reason. Maybe one of their friends is in a band and they're just like awfully competitive or something like that. And I've had people like sit right in front of me and just like sleep me set while I've been there. Yeah. And that makes you very anxious to perform sometimes because you can, especially if like you're the only female on the on the list, which is, I've that's been loads of times. I've been the only girl on on a on a sort of set, and then you've got a load of people on the front row just being rude yeah it, it doesn't off like induce the anxiety I, I, I can imagine that but the point i was going to make about it was that you know if you're doing covers if you're doing well-trodden songs yeah. then you know you can kind of think well you didn't like that can't do a lot about it that's how they wrote it but if you're singing your own material you kind of are wanting to be you, you're seeking approval for it there really aren't you to a well, certain yeah, degree and that definitely. puts extra pressure on it Definitely because, you know, you want the approval and the recognition of your peers. So those people sat in that room, you want them to like your music because they also understand what it's like to be an artist. And like 90% of the time, not all the time, but when you do those t sort of gigs, like the singer-songwriter ones, band ones, you know, for example, if you play at Jimmy's, there will be a lot of musicians in the audience who are maybe playing themselves or they've got friends who are musicians coming along. And you know in your heart of hearts these people understand music to a certain degree and you put a lot of pressure on yourself because you mm. think, if I do a bum note, these are going to know. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, yeah, it can be like that. Matty, if I can come to you, um, some terms used there by Daisy, ADHD, these are almost common abbreviations that we come across. And I come from that generation where ADHD was absolutely not a diagnosed situation. It was like, what's up with him? Is something not right with him? And all of that kind of stuff. When did it become okay, do you think, to start talking about this stuff and recognizing that, hang on a second, you need to be doing something about this and not just saying, pull yourself together. Well, I mean, I think it's a good point. I think some of the issue is in the terminology because, I mean, we've just been doing it a little bit there. When we're talking about mental... When you asked about mental health, we talk about mental illness. We don't talk about mental health. Right. We've just described mental illnesses or, to be technical, the neurodevelopmental disorders. But I think we do that and we kind of... We use the terms interchangeably, but they aren't. And, and it's interesting because, I mean, I know a lot of people as well with, with, with ADHD and creative people and it, it doesn't hold them back in the slightest. 
No. In fact, if they if they didn't have that, they probably wouldn't be the wow. creative force that so they it are. So as, it can be used as a positive. Well, well, it, yeah, and, and that's that's kind of part and parcel of our approach. Really, it's mm. it's about focus upon what's strong rather than what's wrong. Mm. Um, it's not saying that the wrong or the negative doesn't exist. It's just moving out of the centre of the picture. So when we when we look at something like ADHD, we automatically think of something like misbehaving or agitation or irritation or um, uh, lack of concentration, lack of focus, all of the negative things that are associated with it. But no one ever looks at the positive things that it brings to the picture either. Well, I say nobody, but very rarely do people look at the positive things. Yeah. Um, and, and we should, because no condition regardless of how often it's diagnosed, should that define somebody. What made you set your organisation up? Um, well, there's two reasons, really. I've been a mental health professional for a long time. Um, a very critical mental health professional, to be honest. I'm from just up the road, not far from Daisy. Um, and some of the way that we approach some of these problems in living is not the same way that they do in the textbooks. And, right. and, and it's a good thing. It's community works better than antidepressants. You know, it's a fact. We have a lot mm. of research that backs that mm. up. Uh, it works better than most of the common therapies that you will have heard of, uh, or at least just as well, depending on what you read. Uh, so one of the reasons was this critical kind of approach where I was working in a variety of different services around the country, leading different services and having the responsibility to, to work with people for the better, yeah. but they weren't getting better. It was the same people we were seeing. That's the first reason. And the second reason was because I experienced poor mental health myself. So uh, in 2018, my mum died. And quite quickly, um, part of me did. And I became suicidal and all of the things that you'd associate with poor mental health, depression, anxiety. And I was given a diagnosis, which it really didn't matter at the time. And it still doesn't matter now. Um, and in a really weird, maybe twisted kind of way, um, I wouldn't take it back. You know, the, the, the death of my mum, it's really strange, isn't it? But I wouldn't, because it's the best and the worst of you. Mm. And, and now we're in a situation where, you know, we talk about mental health and people, people tend to listen. Daisy doesn't get booed. We don't get booed very right. often either. <laughs> I, just, I just wonder, out of interest for the people who are in the audience at the moment, I'll come to you in a sec. How many people would, in the audience feel as though there is something they can relate to it, that they have something that causes them a little bit of anxiety, stress? Well, I'll show of hands. Wow, pretty much all of you. And just before we come to the question that's going to be asked on the end there, Daniel made a really, really good point. No men have turned up this evening to be in the audience, all women. And that might be quite telling that, really. Sorry, lady over there, what's your name, please? Annabelle. Annabelle, Annabelle what's your question? I don't know, Daisy. I just want to know, do you think with the whole Jimmy thing, that part of the witch, Jimmy's, Can I, can I just ask, what, what, can I just uh, clear up with Jamie, Jimmy's, did you say? The, the music venue. Oh, the music, right, okay, it's only for the benefit of the camera, can you explain that question for us, please? Yeah, so, I, d I don't necessarily think so, I think sometimes it, it can just be an ego thing, it's ne never, I think sometimes, and I hate to say that, but especially with creatives, there does come an air of, I hate saying this also, but just a slight bit of narcissism. I think if you want to be in something, in an industry where you are putting yourself forward for a lot of criticism, you just got to have an air of narcissism to you because if you haven't, you're just gonna you're gonna fall down on every hurdle. And people say narcissism's a bad thing, and it is. But in certain, so yeah, Kim Kardashian's a narcissist. <laughs> but no, there's there's good things, and I say that like very. I don't mean it is like it's great to be a narcissist. No, that, that, that's not what I'm. <laughs> that's not what I'm getting at. But what I'm saying is, if if we take little tiny traits, traits of narcissism, like you know, confidence and things like that, it does help because I think you've got to be utterly fearless in in something like if you want to do acting or singing. Because you know, I, when I was younger, I did acting as well. The amount of auditions I'd go in and I'd be in front of like these directors who done these films now I was like oh my god and I would crap myself I don't know if I'm allowed to say that but I would and uh, and I think you know to, to do something like that you've just got to not care and that does take a little bit of like 
soul death. <laughs> Almost. Just, just to add on to that as well, um, if I can get this cable, what a lot of people sometimes miss the point with an artist like Daisy, what I see like from my perspective is to perform in the way that you do, you really have to put yourself in that emotional space of the lyric or the melody or what the chord progression is. Is it, you know, if it's in a minor key, you're trying to channel a certain feeling. And the, the actual definition of music is the expression of emotion. So, like, when we think of music, it literally is expressing emotion. So to put yourself in that space, it's turbulent. You're going from one song to another to another, aren't you? And you mm-hmm. do it excellently, obviously. Mm. But people don't realise that, like, that is a journey in and of itself. And if you're getting criticism while you're trying to get in that space, you're, open up, you're opening up, aren't you? I think you? as well, like, um, from, a, from a songwriting perspective, like, a lot of the songs I've written are about, like, personal things that have happened to me. So when you've got, like someone being critical sat in front of you and being a bit rude when you wouldn't do that to their art because it, it is their art you know it, it is a little bit of a uh, it, it can take you back you know because some of the songs that i write are about really really personal things and and like you feel a bit stinted by it almost like wow <laughs> but i suppose it just yeah. is what it is you just gotta get on with it do, do you think, now I'll put this to anybody who wants to answer it, you know, you were talking about that some people can be horrible to you. Mm. And social media is the breeding ground for people being horrible to a lot of other people with the trolls and what have you. And I think, this is how I look at it, that we live in a very competitive world. And by competitive, I'm not talking about being professionally competitive. People whose status want to be able to say, I'm doing better than you are. Facebook, again, being a good example of it. And you might have people who think, well, I've just seen Daisy. Daisy's done a gig. I want to top that, so I'm going to try and do a better gig. That's one thing. And then you might get some people who think, well, I can't do a better gig, and the only way that I can get back at her is to say something negative about her. Do you feel, does that fit? Has that got any resonance with you there, Matt? Yeah, yeah, I think, to be honest with you, I think the artist never wins. So I was, I was thinking about this the other day. So there's this idea of artists going out on stage and wearing a mask and performing and then kind of coming back. But... It, like you say, some of some of your music is 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 really deep and and, and meaningful and traumatizing. And every time you go out on stage, someone pays a fiver or whatever it is to come into whatever venue it is, for the price of you re-traumatizing yourself on stage. And then you step off, and the audience have gone, but you're still there with the trauma. Right. You see. I, I mean, like Adele obviously famously wrote uh, a number of albums based upon trauma and breakup, and I know Ed Sheeran's wrote songs about about kind of l- losing children and things like that. Or I don't know if you made that up or not, but. Mm. Bloody good song. Is, is this trauma still in existence? It's great that you're asking the question. I will be going to say, is this trauma something new now? Are we talking about the fact that we've got all of these people who say, I, yeah, I've got this problem, I've got that problem. Is it new or has it always been in existence? It's just now that people are prepared to talk about it. And is it still at the same level? It's just that it was hidden. Well, I think there's more of an acceptance now that, that it's not a a chemical imbalance or an electrical imbalance or a hormonal imbalance or, or a biological cause of that that causes mental illness. I mean, the, f- the facts are there's not a lot of research that backs that up. Mm. Um, what causes poor mental health? In fact, what causes mental health, you know, positive mental health, is a lot of different socioeconomic factors, politics, yeah. a lot of things competing. Um, we talk about stigma. Well, stigmas, we stigmatise ourselves quite a lot as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I do it all the time. I, I always kind of, when I'm training, I always talk about kind of, I'm, I'll, I'll always be a rag ass from Everton Road, always, <laughs> you know, and it stopped me from going for different things and everything else. It doesn't matter what you're achieving, you've chosen field, that will always be a rag ass from Everton Road. Yeah, <laughs> so it's that, that's almost like imposter yeah. syndrome. And that's, I'll come, that's exactly what it is. I'll yeah. come back to that in a short while. Sorry, another question from you there. So ju- just to clarify that, we're talking about Ed Sheeran, Ed Sheeran, Ed Sheeran, Ed Sheeran, try that one sometime, Ed Sheeran. You're it really failing ma- with people's <laughs> names today, aren't you? It's like Daily li- and Egg. It's, it's, it's like, like a little bit Fro- Freudian that if you looked into it <laughs> you know as well. So we're talk- talking about his career, we're talking about the level of fame that he's got and how that relates to people in the industry and how they view him, you mean?
What's it, Daniel? Do you want to? You, you work with the music. You, yeah, well, the, I mean, for me, it kind of comes down to like bands versus brands, and like this whole thing around like corporatism and like the idea of selling products. You know, you've got a perfect skin, you've got a perfect hair, you've got. A, so, like with an artist like Ed Sheeran. Um, and no disrespect to Ed I mean, I love some of his music, but like there is kind of like this machine that operates that's all designed towards consumerism. It's designed to sell you things at the end of the day, isn't it? I think from my perspective, um, it doesn't really bother me in the slightest because in my opinion, there's always enough room on the table for everybody. If you are good at something in life and you keep working hard, you will get to where you want to be. And on the front of like Ed Sheeran, I mean, he does write a lot of songs. He's wrote for Amory. I know he's wrote for One Direction. He is a really talented writer. And, you know, he's won songwriting awards for a reason. And um, I just think it goes back to what, what Daniel was saying. It's, you can either be in this in the music industry for art and you just want to be an artist or you can want to be a machine and they're two very different things you know have you read this term like uh what's it something plants what is it again industry plant industry plant industry plant right 90 percent of the mainstream artists you listen to are industry plants regardless but i think you know even i've seen that term loads on tiktok i'm like you just don't know what you're talking about. Everybody's an industry plant. Soon as you get mainstream or major recognition or major labels invested in you, you don't really have much control over where that money's going into and what they're going to push practically. So you technically, soon as you sign on that dotted line, you are an industry plant. But if you want that level of success and you want to be one of the top 10 selling artists you have to sacrifice that if you're completely fine with with just doing local gigs and being a you know a sort of middle to unknown artist and that is what you love and you would never sacrifice your art for that then that's great as well there's room for that it just kind of it, it it's where you want to sit on the table if you want that success it's going to be harder but there's going to be a lot of sacrifices so i think it it doesn't bother me it just sort of that's what he wanted to do, and that's where he got. I'm going to ask you the blunt question here, because obviously you're a music artist, you write your own stuff, you go on stage, and you've done a great gig, and the audience is thinking, wow, she's marvellous, they're all applauding you. Is there, there's a little bit of ego coming to play there, thinking, you know what, I like being the centre of attention here. I think that's why I don't like birthdays very much. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think I get enough attention through doing what I do. I yeah. don't need a day dedicated to me. I'm like, nah, right. I don't do big days. Yeah. yeah, you know, the admiration from from being an artist and being on stage and all that, yeah, it's, mm. it is great like to, to feel that applaud and to, to have people genuinely come up to you after a kick and go, I love that song that you wrote. Mm. Yeah, yeah it, it does. It, it, it does really feed that ego, but that's down to you as a person to still have that almost to be grounded and to still have that sort of um can't think of the words but just to stay yeah just grounded and not yeah. to to let it get to you because you know at the end of the day i'm i'm still only a local artist if i walk around mm. like i'm dolly parton i think people will be yeah. like what the f i'll yeah. just say i can so <laughs> relate to that though the idea of birthdays when like oh my god the attention's on me any any creative people in the audience like how many people actually have that kind of feeling around a birthday or an event where the attention's <laughs> on you do you know what i mean so there's there are like correlations and similarities between creative people you know yeah i think uh, just on that um it's Whenever we do work with someone around self-esteem outside of the creative industry, anyone, we talk about this idea of, of, of kind of balance. So any RuPaul fans in the house? Come on. Yeah. Shante, you all stay, right? Um, <laughs> well, RuPaul says that what other people think about you is none of your business. And that's a fact, and that's good and bad. So if you're going to say, okay, give me the applause, then you have to expect, you have to expect the negatives. Mm. I say when I work with people and coach them and things like that, the applause doesn't matter. The 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 negative doesn't matter. Yeah. It's art. It stays art regardless. Yeah. Go on then. <laughs> Hello, my own. Can you speak nice and loudly for us, please, if you will, so we can get it on.
No, ego ego's a personality trait, the same as anything else. We all have ego. Um we we I, I prefer to look at it on like a continuum rather than kind of a on or off. People talk narcissism is a is a it's like the new um the new toxic. A few years ago everyone was toxic, relationships are toxic, now everyone's narcissistic. Uh, I think we're all you can relate, we laughed. Yeah, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone's narcissistic now. Um it's like the new thing. Yeah. But no, we we all exist. I don't think anything override what well, well, we don't think anything replaces it overrides it or or there's no quick fix and it's all it's all self kind of defined and personal yeah yeah no 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 it's it's these it's centralizing the positives and, and and then putting the negatives to one side you're not saying the negatives don't exist what you're doing is you're building up a bank of positives so that when the time comes, you can introduce the negatives and you've already got solutions in place. That's not to say you can fix everything with your own solutions. You might have to borrow from other people or you might have to go outside your circle completely and come to the likes of myself or somebody else. But we have these solutions already inherently within us, even when we are, you know... Matty, I was just going to add to that as well. Yeah. We had the conversation yeah. the other day, didn't we, about narcissism? And, and what we were saying was most of, like, the CEOs people that drive these big companies and earn the big money uh, tend to be narcissists. There's a lot of research on it. So if we didn't have narcissists in those positions being able to drive this, uh, we, I think rather than looking at things as a negative and saying, well, that person's different, they've got a narcissistic trait, well, let's look at the positives of what that person's able to achieve. We're always trying to find negatives, and you, like, and, and this is how stigmas start. So then narcissists, you know, the, the, all these different words. When the truth of the matter is, actually, if we didn't have narcissists, we probably wouldn't have had all the big companies that have allowed to give us all these amazing products that we use, phones, computers, whatever. You look at Facebook, you know, and I'm not going to mention there. I was going to say Mark Zuckerberg there, but you can edit that out. Uh, <clears throat> I just did say it. Um, but yeah, you know, it's like, so we need narcissists in the well, world, actually. I, th I think, <laughs> that's the I think a, a, a good example, uh, I mean, narcissism is a, is a word that's come into play quite a lot lately. And if you, if you look back to uh, 1960s, 1970s with the boxer Muhammad Ali, people would immediately say, oh, he's a narcissist because he loved himself, but he was that good. Nobody could ever question the man's ability. And in addition to that, what he did for black rights and things like that, what that man, he stood up for the things he believed in. So perhaps in order for him to have achieved those things, like what you just said there, that degree, that level of narcissism was necessary there. But when it becomes so it's, a neg so it's just demeaning to everybody else, then there's a problem with that. Something I want to ask you, Matty, if that's okay. We've been talking a lot about the traits. We're talking about this and that. Somebody comes to see you, a broken person, right? They might well be from whatever background, say for the sake of argument, we're talking about the creative industries here. They, you yourself have experienced suicidal moments in your life. Where do you start correcting that course and how do you do it? Uh, I, I know what you're getting at when you're saying broken. Um, no one's broken and that's kind of the first rule. No, no one's broken, I'm not there to try and fix them. It's, it's, it's a perspective shift. So it, it's 80-20 it's kind of thing. Most people think that means 80% me, 20% them. It's completely the opposite. Um, I only make people two promises um, when, when I first start working with them. The first one is that first thing, that you're not broken, so I'm not going to try and fix you. And the second one is, you're probably going to want to punch me. <laughs> because it's about awkward questioning. It's about asking the questions that they need to be asked in order to get to that really uncomfortable zone where all the learning and the growth takes place. Um, and that can take, that, that can take a, you know, a few sessions. And the other thing we do in the first few sessions is we, we ban the, 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 the wrong, the, the deficits, the weaknesses. So if you think about, everyone's been to the GP. What does the GP say when you walk in? How can I help? What can I do for you? Yeah, well, who said I wanted you to do anything for me? It's that kind of unwritten relationship, isn't it? It's, I'm not there to, to help you necessarily, I'm there to help you help you. It, it's not a language thing, it's not a semantics thing, it, but it can come across a bit awkward at times, it takes a bit of time to get your head around it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's about looking at things from a number of different perspectives. And even when you feel like you're 100% right in a the situation, there's always learning and growth that can take place, always. It, it's an interesting thing because I mean, there's, uh, everybody probably uses Facebook, social media. And I, I believe that it can be a bit of a lottery that, because the first thing you'll do when you wake up in the morning is you look at Facebook. Now you might see one or two things, something that makes you laugh or inspires you, or something that makes you angry. For example, this morning, 
I, I was part of a forum that was talking about something and somebody, to use the word narcissist again, there was a narcissist on there and I was angry. I started the day off in the wrong frame of mind. And I sometimes think to myself, would there be a discipline there to say, no social media. The first thing you come out of, get out of bed with, try and think to yourself something. I want something that's going to make me happy. Think of something that's amusing or watch something on the television. Just find a, a sketch on YouTube to make you laugh. Because it's almost like they say, breakfast is the best meal of the day. It sets you up for the day. Surely by having a, a, a mental breakfast, if you like, that would be a good thing. You like that one, do you? Right, okay. Yeah. But I do, I, I, I come across things like that all the time. And as I say, you, you're the product of your environment to a certain degree, yeah? Exactly. That's what I was saying. I thought I'm going, I woke up and did that as a matter of habit in the morning. I thought perhaps maybe it's something I'm not going to do anymore. And I'll just watch something that makes me laugh, like GM Great Britain News or something like that, you know? <laughs> that might be the best way. It's, it? it's balance. I don't think avoiding it's going to fix it. I think it's whose responsibility is it for your reaction? Yeah. Yours. Mm. So it doesn't matter what's on your phone, it's your, it's your responsibility to react in a way that's befitting of that situation. And that might take a, a number of times when you go, oh, I got it wrong again. I'm going to have a bad day today, but tomorrow will be all right. And yeah. you just keep pushing and pushing. It's, it's not about kind of avoiding the things that make us unwell. It's not, it's, it's about confronting them a little bit and saying what learning can take place. Yeah. And it's very, it's a fine line between blame and responsibility. We're all yeah. responsibility, for every, uh, we're all responsible for everything that we do. But blame's very different. The connotation with blame is negative. So I'm not mm. blaming you, Roy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, take Most responsibility for your actions. Do you know, the interesting thing as well, uh, and as I say, please feel free, if anybody wants to join in with this, because, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying this is a counselling or therapy session. We all learn something. I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer. I mean, my background is, is in broadcasting and radio, and I've been in talk radio for 20 years. I've probably interviewed over 6,000 people. I've done an awful lot of stuff of it. And there isn't a day that I don't learn something. And I enjoy that aspect of my life, so I'm always wanting to learn something. Um, but just coming back to... I, I'm pretty fortunate. I've never been in a situation where I've struggled with my mental health. I've been really lucky in my life. Circumstances have allowed me to live a fairly reasonable life. Um, but there are times when I get worked up. And I don't know whether or not it's because I'm a Piscean, you know, there's fish swimming in opposite directions. But I know the way I've dealt with it is that I think to myself, right, this is how I feel at the moment. I feel really on the floor there. But I know I ain't going to feel like that in two hours' time. Is that part of a process? I'll ask that to Eddie. Daniel, what do you think? Cause, I mean, there must become moments in your life and you think, this album doesn't sound right. Oh, I'm not in the mood to do it today. But if I come back in an hour's time, I might be different. Yeah, and then it's like the, the never-ending book. Um, I, I think f someone actually said, I remember a quote, I can't remember where it came from, uh, but it always stuck with me and I just thought I'd use the time now to share it. And someone said, if, y if you're depressed, then you may be living in the past. If you're anxious, you may be living in the future. Peace is in the present. And we can only change things through the present moment. Like we can't, like if, you, if you're always thinking about, oh, this is gonna happen, that's gonna happen, you're gonna become anxious because you're thinking you're living in the future, do you know what I mean? Whereas like if you're living in the past and you're constantly thinking, I wish I'd have done this, I wish I'd have done that, then it manifests depression. Um, so like if you just kind of be in the present moment and think like, well, what can I do now to change that and increase your awareness? Because that's what works for me. And I, I suffer terrible with like anxiety even now um, and depression. I think it's just uh, the nature of people who are creative. Um, but yeah, that, that, that saying always keeps me kind of like, yeah, <laughs> works for me. That's good. Now she's point that microphone in that lady's direction there so uh, we, can, we can record what's being said. So what you're saying is that is forgiveness is, as I say, if you're capable of forgiving somebody over a period of time, then is that going to help you feel better about yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it can. I mean, there's no hard and fast rules with these things. It's, mm. it's, it's, 
responsibility taking that's what that's what it is it's it's not about right wrong you know good bad it's situation happened and if we if we focus more upon that person have reasons for their actions uh, put it, look at it this way even if that person's in the wrong and you're completely in the right if you go around sitting with that blame that person probably isn't even aware that you're sat there with all this negative feelings and you're going around for months and months and months but you were in the right so why are you feeling negative mm. See, whereas if you say right at the very beginning, okay, it was a bad situation, maybe maybe they could take the lion's share of the blame here, but actually I'm going to take responsibility for what happened and try and understand them and then go on my merry way. So the question is, yeah. if you're not ready to give up anything? If you're not ready to change anything, then oh, you're right. not ready. I think I've got a good go on uh, then, answer for this. No, because I've been through this, so I, I, I can relate to what you just said. I went through something that was really, really difficult with the person, and... I, c I couldn't forgive them and I don't forgive them. And I think there's this um, this thing, especially in, in social media, you know, if, you, if you're into any sort of like spiritual thing or you follow anything about like positive movement, it's this, it burns my head out. It's forgive everybody, live, laugh, love. Huh? Mm. No, don't always, you don't always have to forgive people. And I've found that like sometimes you need to forgive yourself because in certain situations, I always knew from the start, like my gut instincts was like red flag, red flag, red flag, move, 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 but I ignored it. And I, when I've like analyzed it, like sometimes I think I wasn't even really mad at them. I'm mad at me for letting it get that far. And sometimes th you can't forgive people. They've done something so bad that you know, you know what, I haven't done anything wrong here. And there's peace in apathy. You don't love them, you don't hate them, you're just indifferent. And you don't have to forgive what they did, but you move on from it. And that's the only thing we can do, is just grow and stay in the moment, because if you just sit there, like I did, like being like, I hate you, you put me through hell. Like, you're not gonna grow, you don't learn anything from it, you just hate yourself. So many people torture themselves as well, don't they? Oh, like, with like holding on to it, and it's like, they did this, they did that. But the truth is, in this present moment, in this reality, that isn't the case. It's just a memory. It's an illu It's a concept in the head. And actually, if you look at the science of it, like my recollection of what happened might be completely different to yours. Exactly. Might be completely different. So we create these scenarios in our head, and then we hold on to them. And this happened, and then that creates all this depression, anxiety. Where it's like if going back to that quote again, if you just come back to the present and accept the fact that that was then, but it isn't now, and now we can change and move forward. I'll ask people, I mean, obviously we, we, we're doing this as a project here this evening, but I just wonder if there's anybody in the room here that has, has come here tonight trying to find an answer to something. Is anybody prepared to put their hand up and say they're looking for information? Yeah? You disappear. <laughs> Apart from I thought you were going to say there yeah. was a spirit coming through then. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I got the name John. Yeah, yeah, no, that's another story, isn't it? I just wondered because I mean, it, it, it is. Um, I, I think I suppose in my understanding of uh, oh, maybe it was something I said. I don't know. <laughs> Let you off. Um, but I, I was thinking in my understanding of uh, of um, you know what I know about mental health from people speaking to people like yourself and that sometimes people just cannot as much as they want to tell somebody what the problem is just can't do it and that's a real problem for men in particular yeah yeah it, it is it is and there's no doubt and I, I, this the man thing always comes up and i think it's because the, the statistic that follows that is usually really well it's always really shocking it's the obviously biggest suicide the biggest killer of men in this country under 50. but suicide's also at its highest that it's been since the 80s for women so yeah, so we can't, I'm not laughing about that by the way, but I'm laughing at the fact that people, it's like, we, we shouldn't try and divide to try and move forward. It's, this is about what, what's, what's going on in, in, in society, what's good about society. Look, let's use COVID, right? We had no PPE in the NHS, I still work in the NHS by the way. Uh, we had no PPE, we had, um, we had no sanitizing gel and all this type of stuff. How do we get that? It was people that made it. It was communities. No one asked them to do it. They just done it. Um, I always, I always laugh when I'm driving and you see the blue lights. We always move over to the left, don't we, or to let them pass. Why do we do that? We just automatically do these things. So for me, society and community is is, is fundamentally good. I just think that most of the time. You get institutions like the health service, like the police, all of the institutions that are associated with with the community, who only 
intervene when there's something wrong. So we call it the National Health Service, but really it should be called the National Illness Service, shouldn't it? If you think mm. about it, because you can't access it until you're unwell. Yeah. It, the police only intervene when there's a crime committed. The school board only come around when kids aren't going to school. Social services only want to, you know, do what they do when something's happened. You know, it's it's rather than doing that. Why don't we focus on a proactive upstream approach and try and prevent it from getting to the position that it's in? It's coming back to the the music aspect of what we're talking about here. Can can music actually be a dangerous thing? I'll tell you what I mean by that. Because I mean, listen, you go to a you go to a party. You've had a few drinks. You put YMCA on. Bang! It's marvelous. <laughs> Everybody's having it, right? But then you know, if you were feeling a little bit low and some dido comes on or something like that i mean is that is, is that going to make it a bit worse for you sorry no disrespect to any dido fans and it's the only person i could think of i didn't th what, i didn't think you'd know daniel o'donnell uh, so. I, I don't think so no? i think if you've ever heard that thing you put a sad song when you're sad and it somehow makes you happy i think right. the idea that someone out there can relate to you just is comforting for a lot of people i don't think music ever I've never right. heard of music deterring someone's mental health of anything. Right. A lot of people, like, yeah, like, a lot of people will say to, like, artists, your music helped me through a bad time. I don't mm. think music's ever been something that, like, yeah. killed someone yeah. off mentally or emotionally. Yeah. I, we've got to talk about the pandemic as well, because we, we, we've come out of a very, the very... Pandemic Lovato. Eh? Or Demi Lovato. Lovato. Yeah. Lovato. Yeah. Well, let it go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was um, fast. <laughs> the... We've come out of this pandemic, obviously, and that has been such a... Uh, it's difficult to describe it because everybody's got their own pandemic story, as it were, with, through what's happened in lockdown. Musicians more than anybody, because if you are deprived of the thing that you know brings you joy, then that is... And you think, well, I'm just going to have to sit in the house and do it. Yeah, I could get at the bottom of the staircase near the router and go on Facebook Live. I get that. That's something. But what's it been like as a musician, thinking to yourself... Let's go to you, Daniel. I mean, because you're, oh, you're the producer, you see musicians, and they're looking forward to the gig. There ain't no gig. You've had 18 months of no gigs. You know, a week's a long time being a musical artist, but to go 18 months? Yeah, I think for me, like through the pandemic, um, I mean, you can look at it, obviously, for the things that it caused, like in, in a negative sense, like obviously no performances, lack of income, all these things. But actually, in another sense, if you focus on the the positive aspects of it. It's been a breeding ground for like new artists, new emerging artists, it gave them time to be able to sit down and write and contemplate things. So like, although there was like obviously a dip financially and the socioeconomic uh, impacts of it, I think actually what we'll now start to see is this, all the material that was created during that period now start to come out. And obviously you've been working on stuff as well, a new single uh, gonna be coming out and stuff. So I think for me, it, like there is positives to focus on as well. Um, it wasn't all negative, but it's that balance. It's, it depends what side of the coin you're looking at, doesn't it? Where does that relate to you then, uh, Matty? Have you seen what the, the kind of service that you provide to people? Have you seen a demand for that go through the roof during the lockdown, or does it kind of just remain the same? Yeah, but it's what I got. Uh, what I was getting up earlier on. It's it's. It's this idea that kind of ease is it's it's a greater threat to progress than hardship. So if you if you if you're going through something and it's quite easy, you, there's no there's no growth, there's no development there. If, if that's your yeah, kind no, of default position, uh, it's Denzel Washington. I think I stole that from. <laughs> yeah, what a man. Well, <laughs> well, basically, no. I mean, yeah, we have in terms of demand for the service, definitely. But again, it's it's we're a mental health service. That's the that's the key word. I know it's it, it isn't just semantics. I, I, I'm not just kind of being awkward with words. The language matters. So we're a mental health service. That means it's an inclusive service. So realistically, mental health was already, if we're talking about pandemics, it was already a pandemic. It was already on pandemic scale way before. They talk about this idea of one in four people have a mental health problem any time in their lifetime. I mean, if, if you're going to look at it like that, I'd argue it's a lot higher. Or it's a lot lower. And are we just medicalizing or professionalizing normal human behavior? The stress yeah. is a normal human emotion. What about music minds matter as well, just yeah. to carry on from music that point. They, yeah. they did a survey, it was seven in ten uh, musicians suffer with mental health, so it's, do you know what I mean? It's, it, yeah. is a, it is a problem. Good question. A minimum standard of mental health support, has that been established? We spoke no. about this. We did. Yeah. I don't think so. No, I agree. Even in labels, there isn't like a mental health department to help the artists or anything. I 
don't know. I think there is some change coming because I have seen a few mainstream artists making a lot of comments and um, talking about mental health topics. Like I know Anne Marie talks a lot and has done a lot, and so is like the girls from the Omix. There's been loads that have been talking about it, and there's this producer that I watch, and she's a female, and 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 she did this um, interview and, and she was talking about how there should be mental health services available at the labels and stuff for these artists because you know they're touring and doing all this but they don't care about how some idiot on Twitter is saying that they're fat and ugly they're like even that um, documentary that uh, was it Jessie did that was so sad to watch you know she was like 16 thrust in and I think X Factor and those types of reality TV shows have got a lot to answer for yeah. in terms of the detriment of how it's affected their artists' mental health. I mean, I don't know many artists that have come away from X Factor who haven't come out and said something awful happened on that show. I, I think with that, it's interesting you brought that subject because I'll say something quite radical off the back of that as well. Um, but you're quite right. Let's take X Factor as an example. You're talking about taking people from who might just be working in a very ordinary job. Yeah. They could be working in a fast food the restaurant. They've thing. struggled financially. And the next yeah. minute, you've given them everything. Yeah. And in, and it's that short period of time. They may well be successful on that program for the best part of two, three months. Bang. Gone. How do you go back to that? What you did before, when you've had that up there, that's something else. But uh, X Factor is something else where you can, t you can talk about what it's done to people. Um, I come from an age where... Um, music basically there was always anti-establishment music yeah. when i was going it would be punk rock mods even when you got into the 1990s you had the rave scene there was all this anti-establishment stuff now i'm not promoting revolution or anything here but there is no anti-establishment stuff too much in music now i'm not saying it doesn't exist but the reason you don't see it is because everything's corporatized in music now where it's all about how much money can we make out of it whereas bands didn't care years ago they just want to rip the system up and what have you and now you see demos that sometimes can get out of hand because people are desperate to do something to rebel against the system whereas music used to provide that is it providing it now that's one for all of you there or anybody else who wants to pick up on it and that's a really tricky question is it will is young's it? fault it, it's all Will Young's fault. <laughs> well, it's, I think it's reality TV in general, isn't it? Yeah, we like saw Love it with Island Jeremy Kyle. and stuff. Yeah. You know, it, I just think I, it, it's that, um, it's almost like Instagram as well, you know, that instant gratification of this fame and these people, as we were saying, even when you, for example, you could be an independent artist for years before you get any label recognition and then all of a sudden, say your album does really great, out of nowhere, you're getting all this this pressure and stardom, and nobody's really there to help you deal with it. Mm. So, so, I mean, I think I'm going off your question a bit, but I think. No, but I know, I, I know where you're going. With you know where I'm going with it. Yeah. Like, I think mm. the anti-establishment thing. You're right. It, it's not really like that anymore. But I think that's because the music industry like I was saying earlier, is so controlled if you yeah. want to be that level But it is, if you turn artist. around and say, right, you, we, we're paying you this much and uh, everyone's like, wow, I'm having a great lifestyle. And then you say, well, don't upset the sponsor. I said, but I don't like that sponsor because they're, they're kind of paying buttons to sweatshop people making clothes in, in China or something like that. And you want to say something about that, but you can't upset the sponsor. You know, and this, this is what I'm saying. It's, music has become very, very kind of controlled. No, it has. It totally has. And, and like, I think yeah. There's a level of exploitation in the whole thing, though, and it goes back to what you were saying about, yeah. like, performing. You are the product. You know, you're, you're selling yourself and your art. Um, and I think in terms of, like, reality TV shows, I mean, using X Factor as an example, I mean, you can look at it and kind of blame X Factor as a model and the team and say, well, they're going to exploit this, this particular person. And I've worked with people off X Factor, and you know a few. Yeah. Um, but then you ask yourself, well, actually, is it the responsibility of the actual company producing the programme? Or have the audience watching it got a, an a question to answer? Because if, because if there wasn't an audience, yeah. there wouldn't be a programme. So yeah. as a society, there's a bigger issue. We, we want this kind of entertainment, but we forget the fact that these are real people's lives. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? What, what about, I'll be with you in a second, what, what about um, when it comes to mental health, Things that you can't do anything about. For example, uh, Prime Minister, how many times people have probably wanted to throw something at the television. Donald Trump, for example. And you think to yourself, these people are making me angry. And I can't do a thing about it. How do you deal with that, Matt? Well, it's a, it's a circle of influence thing. So it's, it's an education thing. If you're working with somebody, either an individual or a group, 
they have their own influence and you, and you try and work with them to educate themselves as to what's in that. So they, they can't, we can't dictate what Boris Johnson does. Yeah. And uh, even, even this, we call him Boris, you know. He's, he's human. He's, yeah, he's, yeah, not, yeah, my, he's yeah. not my mate. You know, and just, just just out of interest as well, Mo, Mo, all his family actually call Boris Xander because his yeah. name's Alexander, Alexander, his surname's Xander. <laughs> just so you know, yeah. you know what I mean. So, yeah. Um, so but yeah. no, but, but it's it's that type of thing, and it's 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 you can't control things. When when we're working with communities, we ask three questions. We 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 spend a bit of time working with them so that they can identify the strengths and gifts and assets that they have individually, and then we try and connect them to the local community haven't already had individual conversations with maybe their neighbours and people in their street. And then we ask three questions. We say, what, what skills and assets do we have that allows us to address our, our, our problems on our own with the assets that we've identified and the skills? And then we say, where do we need a bit of help? And that outside help could be an outside institution, a youth club, a community centre, wh whatever. Yeah? And then we ask a third question, what can't we do anything about? Mm. And usually the political stuff, apart from when you get a chance to vote or if you go on a demonstration and you do it peacefully and all this type of stuff, you can do something then. But your time to do something is voting time, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. What, per me personally? Oh. I'll let the artist answer that if you want. I, I mean, I, I, I think it's, the, it's, it's the, I would have said, and I speak as somebody who's not in the music industry like these guys, it's, you think to yourself, if you are in a, the early stages of your career and you want to advance, there is an element of towing the line. And if it is the question you think, well, because there's a lot of artists who decided, ah, I don't care about this, I'm just, they, but they didn't go on to do anything. And it, there's an argument, there's a statement that I've used before, a phrase that I've used before, principles are great when you can afford them. I think well, no, it's it's not just money. Yeah. It's 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 um it's, it's, it's credibility as well in well. being further up the ladder, so you can do the things that you want to do. That's the well, that's thing, though, isn't it? It's classic. It is. It, they sold out to the corporate dogs. It's a well-trodden phrase over years, and yes, they did. But it's only human nature. To want it to, so you think to yourself, right, what can I do? Can I remain principled and remain living in me two up, two down? Or can I just toe the line and not say anything and I can look after my family and kids for the rest of their life? That's a difficult line to walk, really. I mean, we can look at political parties um, and we can kind of identify with a party or we can just look at it through the lens of like logic and compassion and think, well, actually... No. no, no. But if you put your beliefs out there, would you just be scared that would affect your like? I've started working with the charity Tough uh, Unity of Face Foundation because we're literally working at a grassroots level. And it's like, I mean, I've just done a workshop down in London and Varindra Sharma MP, who's the MP for Ealing in Southall, came down. And I think there is a new way now, I think after the pandemic, this idea of exploiting artists for our own entertainment. I mean, we've seen the X Factor's now not going to be renewed again. Um, so I think society is changing. And I think for me to be able to go and work with like grassroots artists around the country with a charity, it's, 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 it's inspiring as much for me, you know. But I think that on that aspect, I mean, I can relate to that myself because I think it was last year we were working on a very political song and my management was like, Kill, you can't pull that out. And I agree, I wouldn't put that out. It was, we, 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 we sampled Donald Trump in it. It was very <laughs> out there. It was very abstract. I was like, wow. Um, so, I was the one saying put it out. But, <laughs> yeah. I think... Well, but music well, John Lydon sells kind of butter now. I mean, he's hardly a punk. I think who put the who, who who made the decision that artists need to take responsibility for everybody else? Yeah, but they don't have to take responsibility for I think just get your own house in order. I think that's where it should start, and then and then let let you know. I think there's nothing original anymore, and that's cool. It's okay. Oh uh, yeah, I agree. And I think sometimes in in the start of your early career, all right, when you've made a certain stand for yourself and you've sort of establish yourself a bit better, maybe then you can 
be a bit more vocal. But being honest, I don't think in the industry I th- I at think the it's minute there's the a ends lot of room for the it. You know, the bottom line is that you could have you could have a great message yeah. across, and you want to get it across in your music, and people say, "Well, we're not touching that artist because they've got such kind of strong views on things." And you I think, know. "Well, I tell you what, Trojan horse it." I'll kind of just toe the line. Then I've got a big platform. Then you can come out yeah, with your views. It. Some people might regard it as way. being hypocritical, but once you've got there, then you can do it. But let's not veer too much away from the mental health. I'll take another question and then we'll move on to something else. Yeah. I don't know. I, I can relate to that. Because I remember in the in the pandemic, I was a bit vocal on things, and even on TikTok, people were berating me for it, like, who are you? And I was like, okay, so I'm not going to talk on that then. That's that. Coffin nailed. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly, you took the yeah. words out of my mouth, yeah. I think the other thing as well, just moving on to something else about, you know, what television programs can actually do for your mental health as well looking at things I mean there's a lot of mind-numbing stuff on the box at the moment but where does technology has moved us forward in terms of you know what phones communication all of that kind of things the actual attitude seems to have gone backwards in a lot of cases for me in Edwardian times you would have the good women of a town who would all meet together and decide who was the most worthy cause the poorest person you'd have all these people coming up and begging effectively and it was almost like the X Factor and whoever had the biggest sob story got on and I'm thinking to myself when I watch things like the X Factor is that actually doing stuff for people you know when people are watching that if you if you think to yourself like you know are we do we do we enjoy watching people who've got a, a bad life is, is there something about that we used to watch people getting eaten in the Coliseum yeah, well, absolutely. And even in the 1800s, you <laughs> used to have public hangings. Public hangings, yeah. I yeah. mean, it wasn't even that long ago, 1960, yeah. it, it stopped. Yeah. You know, it's art imitates life all over So it's, 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 it's a standard human trait. Do you know, I, I was going to so. say, I think everybody just loves a good rags to riches story. Yeah. Personally, yeah. I Could think we that. love that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'll tell you what, we'll take, we'll, uh, if anybody else wants to throw a question, I know you've had uh, some great questions you've been putting at the moment, but I am conscious of time. We're going to have to wrap things up in a short while. Uh, is anybody else would like to? Yes. Um, <laughs> I think for me, it's just, it comes down to like awareness, self-awareness and mindfulness and just trying to constantly play that game of ego versus self, of staying in that present moment and being aware of the monkey mind that's always chatting away. Because once you start identifying with it and you go down that road of like, and cause you, I mean, you sort of constant like self-criticism, this isn't good enough to... But I think if you just become aware of the fact that you actually are empowered and in control, you know what I mean? But if you allow doubt to start creeping in, so once you, for me anyway, like once I increase my awareness to the point where no, actually, you know, I'm not going to listen. Because there is, is a constant narrative all the time in everyone's mind, you know what I mean? You're not good enough, you can't do this. Blah, blah. So if you just try to overcome that, I think that for me is like the first step. But I don't know what good mental health looks like, even if it does exist. Well, I was going to say in my case, like, obviously, because I've got, like, ADHD, it's, my mental health can spiral very quickly if I'm not on top of it. And in my experience, what my good mental health is when I'm at a, a decent controlled space is structure. And I really strongly need a lot of structure in my life because if I don't, then I just as I said, I just completely spiral. So things that help me is like, you know, getting up early if I can, start on my day, maybe doing a little bit of meditation. I know they're so cliches, but these really do genuinely help me. And I know when I'm not doing these things, how badly in a matter of days my mental health can deter. It's also for me just keeping on top of like my finances, keeping on top of, because people don't realize no one likes to talk about money either. When you're like 600 pounds overdrawn, that doesn't half put a stress on you and, and it messes with your head, you know? And I know loads of people about half a user 600 pounds overdrawn, that's why you're laughing. I, we get it, you know what I mean? And it stresses you, you're like, oh, shit. 
But um, it, it's things like that. It's like just taking a bit of control back and knowing that I have got a bit of control over this and that I can direct my life in some way. That's, uh, sorry. Yeah. It's, it's this self-definition thing. It's, it's what it means to me. And, and my mental health is, is, is mine and your mental health is yours. I think, Dan, you've just described what good mental health looks like because it's your truth, it's yours. Well, <laughs> well I'm not saying it worked for me. <laughs> yeah. and, perfect. and the reason things are cliche is because they tend to work for people. So they become cliche. So it's good. I, I like meditating as well. I like music. Um, but I think there's a bit of a myth that, that we need more mental health awareness. There's loads of awareness out there, you know, loads. You can Google it. You can even sing it now and it'll just come up on your phone. Hi, Google. Um, but it's action. It doesn't, there's not a lot of action. So you've got to go beyond this state of awareness to a state of action. Otherwise, it's kind of mm. pointless. It's just information that you'll probably leave here and you'll forget. Um, so you have to back that up with, with behavior. So whatever you decide mental health means to you, attach some actions to it and it'll stick. I think the other thing, we, we've kept you long enough here and we appreciate it. We'll hang around for a short while longer if anybody wants to have a, a, a more of a conversation or if you'd like to maybe do something to the cameras to talk about uh, how the night has been for you, that'd be great. But a uh, big thanks, of course, to Becca and Alan who put, uh, put this event together for us this evening. Thanks to Daniel, to Daisy and, of course, to uh, and Matty thanks and the guys at the, uh, at the coffee centre here. We appreciate that. So, yeah, thank you very much indeed. It's about mental health. I wrote this a few years ago um, and I got funded off with a pool pride for the music video. So I hope you like it. I saw you the other day. You didn't say hi, you just ran away. And I don't have the time to pay, but I'll just stay in. Thank you.